Well, hi, good morning, and thank you for coming and joining me, keeping me company in my shop while I work on this Philco radio you see on the bench. Today is March 28th, almost the end of March already. Wow. So uh, this radio is fixed up pretty much 100% ready to go except for one thing, and that's this special Philco capacitor. Looks like an ordinary capacitor, but apparently it has a coil inside it. Now there is something very subtle about this that I noticed. As I rotate it around, there's a point where the light shines on it and reveals, and I don't know if you would see this. Let me look in the camera. Yeah, you can see it. Can you see that there's a bit of a line running right through here? Hard to see. A little easier with my eye, but you can see the, the light is doing something right at that point. There's a slight ridge or raised area right here. And what I'm pretty sure that is, is a wire from the coil that's under here. So there's a coil wrapped in here, some number of turns, I don't know how many. The lead wire coming out here, and the other lead wire. The other lead wire, well this is interesting too. So one of these is going to be connected right to the capacitor element and the other one is going to be connected to the coil and the coil. Hard to tell which one. This, this is a little more central. This one's a little bit offset from the center. This is probably the one it probably attaches. Now where, where's that wire again? Because that wire would line up. I would think. Where'd it go? There it is right there. No, well yeah, actually it's coming along and it's showing up right here. So probably this connects to the wire that comes up. Wire. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't have to. Anyway, you know what? I got a picture of one of these taken apart. Hey, <laughs> no reason to sweat over that one. Let's look at what I found on Radio Museum. So as I just mentioned, this is Radio uh, Museum. They have a section where people can make comments or tell stories or whatever it is they do. And so here's one uh, on the website. Make a new special inductive capacitor. How to make a Philco special capacitor. And I'm not going to read this right now, but uh, in this case, 46421. That's a certain type of radio, and it has a C401. I've got a C303. Maybe they're almost identical. I don't really know. So, uh, point two capacitor. There's a picture of it. So, this is the remade one the fellow's building. So, he, he's grabbed the capacitor, wrapped this wire around it here. Uh, but if I were to peel, and I am going to peel the cover off that other capacitor in hopes of revealing the coil inside because I need to know how many turns or how big this coil should be, or at least roughly, then there's a tuning process you have to go through. See how he's got this capacitor coil connected to these clip leads, and this is a scope lead here. So what he's doing is he's uh, applying a single frequency. I might use a sweep frequency on it. He's applying a single frequency and then adjusting it up and down in frequency across the range of the capacitor, and then he's adjusting the number of turns in the coil so that the coil and, and the capacitor together resonate at the desired frequency. And there's his finished job. He just put a shrink sleeve right over top of the whole thing. And bingo, there you are. You can see the capacitor lead here and the coil lead coming out the other side. That's exactly what I'm going to do today. I'm going to do exactly this. Okay, first step along the way is to find a suitable capacitor. Now I've got two here. Let's just make sure what size this is. Can you actually write it on here? Right there. 0.2 microfarads. 400 volt, I believe that says. There's no way you're going to get 400 volts there. It's definitely 0.2. Well, that's interesting now. Somebody scratched away the uh, cover over top so they could read the 0.2. That's not me. I didn't do that. Or is that just a coincidence? Hmm. I wonder if this came from another radio. 
Okay, so I have two possible ones. It's a point two two, big uh, big one, big diameter on it, and a point two two here. But the thing about this one is, it's a mica mold. <laughs> I beat up on the mica mold company there, uh, over their crummy capacitor that was uh, in here. I shouldn't say crummy. Of course, it's crummy at this point in time. I mean, we're, we're way down the road on these things. This looks beautifully sealed, and it's about the right diameter. And that's important because if I'm going to count the number of, assuming I can uncover the wire here and count the number of turns, I'm going to replicate that on this different diameter, different number of turns, different size wire would have an impact too. Let's test this. Maybe it's no good. This has never been in a radio, but it's old. So you would call this new old stock. NOS. New old stock. Never used old stuff. Let's see what it says. So it's come back at 0.27 microfarads. It says 0.22 on it. It's reading 0.27. A little bit of a higher reading. Hints that there's a leak, that it's leaking. Uh, VLOS and ESR, I don't think really pay much attention to those. I think that's more pertinent in modern electronics than uh, than in uh, this old stuff. But let's let's put it on the high voltage tester and see what it says. Now, a slightly leaky capacitor probably wouldn't hurt too much there in that position. Let's find out. Another gray day here. It's just been gray days for months and months and months. And the odd sunny day, maybe one or two a month. It's really unusual. Okay, here's the eye. 50 volts. Watching the eye, what will it do? This is it opened up all the way. Beautiful. 150 volts. It takes time to charge. We have to wait a little bit. opening up all oh, that's pretty much all the way so we're not going to go at a higher voltage this is a pretty good test let me put this back on here the good capacitor is going to hold the charge I put a couple hundred volts there this unit will bleed the charge off when the switch is not operated there's a short on here okay hopefully this guy's discharged if I suddenly yell for no reason you'll, you'll know why Okie dokie, this will be the guy. Now, next stage I think is to tear, tear this thing apart. I should just try melting the wax off. I haven't got time for that. Stick a knife down there. I'm gonna, there, there's all the wires. I'm gonna end up disrupting the coil. What does it really matter? Okay, I'll drink a little coffee and then get my knife out. Okay, so it looks to me that there's a cardboard tube. And I threw that's true of all these capacitors. They have a cardboard tube with a wax on top. Where is the coil? My guess is the coil is under the cardboard tube, and then there's some other layer of another tube or something inside. What are the chances that you can get the coil out of this thing intact? Like get the pull the capacitor out? Oh, I can't imagine that. Well, I think you know that's where the wire is. And just pick the back side here. You know, I said somebody had scraped this away, but I don't think so because it's all missing in here too. So I think it's just coincidence that the wax has disappeared right above the number point two. Okay, let's uh. Let's start hacking away. I really don't know how to do this in some kind and gentle way. I am going to be using the uh, Swedish fish knife here. Cora, Sweden. Cora, probably a town in Sweden. Where'd that wire go? It's like here. I don't know. Just start hacking.
stab myself. That looks like a, a molded capacitor there. Is that what that is? A molded capacitor with a coil on it and then this cardboard over top. Soaked in beeswax. Yeah, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but don't correct me. I think the wax that's used in these things is bee wax. There we go, I got right through it that time. So in reading up on this, I did read that some people have done just what I've done and they can't find a coil. And the thinking is, it's really the way in which the capacitor is constructed. This, 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 here's the end of the foil and then there's a gap here full of black compound. Less so on this side. Where's the coil? Where's that wire thing I saw? So it was lined up with the offset. It's a seam, it's a paper seam. Not a piece of wire. You can see a metal foil coming over and disappearing under here. Just filler to make because the, the case is bigger than the capacitor itself. Get this paper off. Something underneath this paper. Oh. Fish knife, not good enough. No, it's my fish knife skills. Just a, like an outside foil. This is all stuck. This isn't going to pop off. The paper I'm talking about here. Yeah, I actually did this kind of thing with big power cables. Only I used a tool called a hack knife, which is not unlike this, only it's a very heavy, thick blade. It's very thick. And it's a very, uh, it's a very rough, short knife. And you put it on the thing you want to cut, and you take a hammer and you whack it, whack, 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 and it cuts. And, and what are you doing with a knife and a piece of cable? Well, because the cable had a lot of lead, the covered in lead, a lead pipe basically, and you can chop through lead with the knife quite easily. And so you would take the hack knife. Here we go. There we go. Hack off, much like I'm doing now. Hack off the outside of the cable and reveal the inside. Now this looks like a capacitor coming here. Let's see. This didn't go anywhere. This didn't go anywhere. Where were? It's just laying on the outside. Where's the coil? I think I'm down to the capacitor here. My, my plan was to examine the coil. Yeah, this is capacitor coming apart. Is the coil right on the inside? That, that can't be the case, guys. I have to peel through all this. Where's the coil?
So somewhere it says on the internet that in the case of these radios, often you can just stick a point to the capacitor with, forget the coil, stick a point two in there and it should work fine. And uh, when I had the uh, capacitor substitution box going in there, I found once I got the capacitor up around 0.01, the radio kind of stopped working. Suggested to me it was too that was too big. Of course, this is a point two. Here, where oh where has the coil gone? There never was one. So you know, somehow the. Uh, capacitor uh, tapes are done in some way that causes an inductive reactance. It said right on the outside of the capacitor, it was a special capacitor. It seemed to me if I put a point two in here without the uh, coil, you would get uh, you because based on using the uh, capacitor substitution box, you'd end up with a dead radio. Yet people are saying, "Yeah, just just put in a point two and don't worry about the rest of it." The aluminum changed. This is really, really shiny. This is not. This is just the other side of the foil. I'm seeing. Got paper on it. I'm not too hopeful of the finding in here at this point. Let's just keep going. It must be some kind of core piece in here. finger there. Don't do that. It didn't go very well. Back in the day, there was a chemical, did I already talk about this, called, uh, I think I did talk about polychlorinated biphenol or PCB. And it was in all the newspapers and everything, PCB found in birds, egg shells and stuff like that. And the world got quite concerned about polychlorinated biphenols and where are they used? It's an oil and it has a uh, very good, uh, uh, you can't set it on fire. So when it comes to electrical equipment full of oil, that's an ideal kind of oil. Because if the equipment should fail, then you don't have a huge oil fire, which is what happens with those big transformers when they short a huge tank of oil. And they, they just, it causes a huge fire. So a lot of buildings have transformers in them, large transformers in the basement or sometimes halfway up tall, tall buildings. The transformers are huge tanks of flammable oil run it with electrical components in it. Oh my gosh, that's a fire waiting to happen. It's some of those buildings. Let's talk about the uh, uh, Toronto and the big building in Toronto, the biggest, the CN Tower. So the CN Tower has three huge transformers up in the pod. And the power cables rise up the inside of the tower all the way up to the pod. That's like a thousand feet up or something. The restaurant pod. Those transformers were filled with uh, a oil called Ascarel. That's the uh, brand name. And that's just straight polychlorinated biphenol oil. Why? 
because it won't catch fire. And that'd be a good thing on the top of the CN Tower. You wouldn't want a fire up there, would you? Big tank of oil flaming away. That would look like a Roman candle. The size of a, a city-sized Roman candle going. Well, when the world turned against PCBs, those transformers were already up there and the tower had been built around them. They'd been, during the tower's erection, the transformers had been hauled up, placed, and then the pour continued and the tower was built around them. So there's really no way to get them out. So you have these Ascarel filled transformers sitting there, thought of like a time bomb. I remember in the press it saying if those transformers failed, or if one of them failed, and the smoke came out of it, the smoke would contaminate the CN Tower and make it off limits forever. You know, I don't know, is this this just wound all the way down? I think it's wound all the way down. Right, I'm sure there's no coil. So uh, the company I was working for decided, well, we got to get rid of them. We've got to get rid of those transformers. We can't put oil-filled oil tank transformers up there. How are we ever going to do this anyway? Because there's no door to pass them in and out of, and they're a thousand feet in the air, and they're huge, heavy transformers. So what they had to do, and incidentally, when they built the CN Tower, I think, I think there's three transformers. They actually positioned a spare transformer up there at the time. So they bought four transformers, hooked three of them up, and kept one spare in case one of the other three failed because they knew there was no way to replace them without some huge undertaking. Well, all those got replaced. And what, what happened was a company came in, like a General Electric or whoever it was, they dismantled the existing transformers, cut them into pieces, and took the pieces down the elevator, the CN Tower elevator, and uh, disposed of them, and meanwhile brought up a new air core, or air cooled, no oil, no Ascarel, no nothing transformers, air cooled ones, in pieces, and assembled them up in the top of the tower in the uh, transformer room. Huge undertaking to get just to get rid of the uh, PCB. I, you're not going to find a coil in here for crying out loud. This is just going to go right down to nothing. So, an interesting question is is there Ascarel or PCB oil in any of these kinds of things? Like, this has oil in it, I'm pretty sure. A very small amount. Is there any PCB in here? And the answer is no. And I can't go into it now because I've run out of time, but one of my career highlights was warning North America about PCB contamination in underground power cable splices due to a particular kind of tape. Uh, a cloth tape called a varnished cambric tape, which is used in high voltage uh, splices. You buy it in a can, uh, like, a, like a round thin can, open the lid and there's the tape and oil floating around in it. The oil was 50% uh, polychlorinated by phenol, but nobody knew that. And jointers taking that with their hands and applying it on the joint. Doing this for, for it's all through the 1950s, maybe 19, late 40s, early 50s. PCB was a wonderful chemical, by the way. It was got into uh, women's makeup got into house paint, got into all kinds of things because it was a very, very useful industrial chemical, except it's verboten now, verboten. So so, uh, so anyway, uh, based on what I had discovered, I won't go into how I discovered it, but I did, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, very, very heavily contaminated, let, let me back up. The transformer, now, aside from the ones I've been telling you about, the transformers you see out on the poles around around the town in that, those never had Ascarel oil in them. It's very, very expensive oil. But what happened at most utilities was they purify the oil periodically. Maybe every five years you come out, you, you, maybe you take the transformer down, maybe you don't. You take it down, you hook it up, you drain the oil, you put fresh oil in, you send it back up on the pole, you, you do the sort of regular maintenance. But in the course of doing that, the odd Ascarel transformer gets involved with the same equipment that you're doing all the other transformers with. So a certain amount of contamination takes place. So suddenly you can find three and four percent 
PCB oil in a mineral oil tank for a pole mounted transformer. That was defined as too much. And so all that had to go too. So it was a, a big effort to get rid of all this PCB. One, two, three percent PCB. But what I had found was 50 percent PCB. I mean, it was it was the real stuff in this tape. So uh, anyway, word went out right across North America. Um, I, I, I I don't know how that happened because I didn't announce it. I don't ha I didn't have any ability to announce anything to anybody except within my own group. But somehow. The word went out and utilities were reporting finding the same thing in their cable splices that they're they had no idea of this so guys we're working on this stuff it's arguable whether pcb is really a dangerous chemical or not you can argue about that but nevertheless they were being exposed to it tremendously they're putting torches on it making it smoke doing all kinds of stuff yeah if you actually do burn pcb oil if you heat it up high enough it will produce some of the most toxic substances in the world so you don't want to burn it. If you don't burn it, it's extremely stable. Burn it at a high enough temperature and you can destroy it completely. But uh, so that's a story on uh, PCB. It was a big deal when I was uh, in college and uh, into the early 80s. That and acid rain, remember? Acid rain, acid rain gonna destroy the whole world. We've got to take tremendous action. Acid rain, acid rain. What happened? Well. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it kind of went away. And so what about the PCB? I think if I stopped five people on the street, back, back when I was doing this stuff, if I stopped five people on the street and said PCB, they'd have an idea what I'm talking about today. No, but what? What are you talking about? Nobody knows. Uh, that's, that's how it goes with current events, right? They're only events while they're current. Having torn that thing totally apart, did not find any hint of a coil in it whatsoever. What am I to do now? Do you assume that the, somehow those uh, wraps that we saw were wrapped in such a way that it produced an inductive reactance? I didn't see it. I didn't see anything unusual going on in there. So maybe the best thing to do is to take the new capacitor no coil stick it in there see if the radio works according to my experiment with this no way because as soon as i got anywhere near the 0.2 capacitor value the radio was quiet yeah i think before i spent a lot of time making a coil that i've already heard may not even be necessary and doesn't appear to even exist uh, i think i'm going to drink some coffee and then experiment some more yeah, just thinking about it a little more. I'm going to finish off that story about the PCB stuff. How did I discover PCB stuff? Well, it certainly went completely by accident. So I was in the office of the uh, safety officer of my company. This is a company with about 1,200 employees uh, working in, in Toronto, supplying power to Toronto. And he's got a bunch of uh, jars of uh, samples of uh, pieces of cable that are going to be sent off to a lab to be tested for PCB. Then on the edge of his desk is a jar with some water in it with some oil on top. And I just casually said to him, what's that? And he goes, well, it's just a, just a sample from manhole water with some oil on top. And so, you know, we have to deal with this oil and uh, you know, the oil itself is a problem regardless of what kind of oil it is. That you're not supposed to put oil down the sewer and all that kind of stuff. So I, so I said, well, what are you doing here? Well, I'm sending these off for the PCB test. I go, why don't you send the oil too? Just send it. He goes, no, nah, we, we don't do that. We, you know, we, we don't test the water that way at all. And I left. But I made him curious enough that he took the jar and he stuck it in the tray and off it went to a laboratory to be tested. And then uh, uh, I got a call from him a few days later. He goes, Jim, you won't believe it but there's PCB contamination in the manhole uh, oil. What, what, you know, this is kind of weird. Where's the oil coming from anyway? It's coming out of cables. They aren't oil, dripping oil pipe flowing cables. It's just more like this capacitor I just took apart where oil is soaked into insulation and that. There's a little bit of excess oil and a long piece of cable, so a few drops come out now and then if the cable cracks open. Oil comes out a little bit. That's what got sent off. 
So I thought, that's kind of weird. Uh, I decided to go a little further. So I just finished examining a blown cable splice. Cable splices are about this big, weigh about 150 pounds, big copper conductors and big sleeves uh, soldered onto them. It's a big, it's a big, big thing. But in there are a series of tapes. And I peeled down through through the tapes. I'd gone right through this varnish cambric tape, not not just you know, don't know anything about it, just taking it off. Through some of that, uh, through through some of it, I can't remember how I did this now. You know what we did? We sent the entire splice, I remember now. We sent the entire splice. I drove it. Now nah, memory's coming back. Threw it in my truck, drove it all the way out to this laboratory that was operated by a provincial power company called Ontario Hydro at that time, which which no longer exists, and brought it to the laboratory and I said, here you go, and what's this here for? Uh, can you just test this for PCB? We, we found PCB contaminated oil in the manhole. There's no way transformers can leak oil into a manhole. It must have come from the cable, so maybe there's some Ascarel in the cable. Maybe they used Ascarel oil in the cable. And the expert there said, no, 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 never been done. Never, never, ever used Ascarel on a power cable. It's too expensive, and no, there's no need for it. Uh, you know, it's, it's for fire prevention in very serious locations because it's very expensive oil. Okay, well, here's my joint any, or cable splice anyway, and I left. A couple days later, I get a phone call uh, from the lab technician. And he's very upset. He says, what did you give us? I said, you know what it is. It's a cable splice. He goes, yeah, but... You know, the way we do the test, we take the sample, then we uh, um, dissolve the sample, and we water it down, water it down, water it down, actually using solvent, not water, of course, but get very, very uh, uh, low, low level of contamination, if there was any to start with, and we put it into our testing machine, which is extremely sensitive, and then we read it. We did that with the sample you, 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 you sent, and now our test equipment is so contaminated we're going to take two days to bring this equipment back by cleaning it up. There's that much in it. How much? 50%. From where? You just told me. A cable has no oil. Like has no Ascaral. Where did it come from? And they had identified varnished cambric tape. The varnish itself. A little bit of research. Turns out, yes. The cambric tapes were made with 50% Ascaral based varnish. Why? If you mix in this Ascaral oil into the varnish, the varnish becomes very, very flexible. Most varnish, as you know, is very stiff. So you have a tape, and you have a tape with varnish on it, and you're going to wrap it around something. It can't be stiff. It has to be very flexible. There you go. So from that day forward, any time a splice of a certain age or date range was worked on, the jointer, instead of just working on it, wore a complete... Uh, protective clothing, uh, face mask, goggles, breathing apparatus, the whole shot to work on this stuff from then on. And that was me telling the safety officer, do something unusual. Send that water sample. And it, it just kicked all this stuff into action. Now, you could argue the whole thing was baloney anyway because PCB not that dangerous and it was all overblown. You could argue that. I don't know. But anyway, obviously it's not an issue in society anymore, even though it was top of the list for a while. Top of the list. Well, thank you for listening to that. <laughs> As I, sometimes I travel down memory lane in, in my shop here. So, Okay, now, back to what I, what I, what did I say I was going to do? Put the capacitor in, see what the radio does. Yeah. Okay, got the capacitor just about soldered in. doing this in a way that if this doesn't work I can recover this capacitor <laughs> put it back in my parts box I'm not cutting the leads down that means I'm gonna leave some leads kinda hanging out in here it's a little, a little bit like an antenna but I don't think it's gonna make any difference if this doesn't work I'll just remove it and I don't know what I'll do then I don't know. Let's see. Okay, just checking now. Oh, that might be a little hot. Okay. 
Okay, no shorts. Okay, let's give it a go. I'm going to turn it, set it right up like this. I still have managed to not break these wires. Wow, they should have broke a long time ago. All the tugging I've been doing. Now I do have the antenna booster here, but I'm pretty sure my antenna switch is not set to the shop. Let's get it out of here. Take it out of here for now. So I don't think it's going to do anything until I throw the switch. Let's give it a go. Okay. Better to stand back a bit during this. Okay. Put away the now famous Swedish fish knife. Just, just for those who might be a little upset, look, I've got a, a Finnish fish knife also. So, just, just in case. Okay, now, enough delays. Switches on, power, ooh, 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 power went on. One click earlier than I expected there. Tim bulbs have worked properly. What's all that? Doesn't sound good. <laughs> it does not sound good. What is happening? What was happening there? Doesn't smell like anything burned up. Let's go again. Let's go again. I got chicken there. That's all that happened. Let's go again. When I hear that sound, what I imagine is coming is a big explosion. Bop! That's what I imagine. Maybe I left this on. Even from there, it was putting out a bit of signal. Okay, so this is a radio on its own, but my shop is a terrible place. That's not bad for in my shop, by the way. Antenna tuning. Make any difference? I'm at the low end here. The capacitor is more effective at the high end anyway, but there's nothing up here. The interference. I'm sure that's not the radio. That's it's picking up this noise from. I'll bet you it's this. My lights are overloaded. Let's see. Yeah, see that? Noise sources in my own shop here. Not much. Something else, too. Well, we got it working. It seems okay. Oh, that's interesting. So, they've reached the end of the dial, and there's a station there. But there shouldn't be a station there. This station is actually higher on the dial somewhere. So we do need to do a little bit of alignment work here to get the uh, station into the right place on the dial. An easy job. So, so this is probably 590. 
They should be hearing it here. Five ninety straight up. See if I can get there. No. Some good performance out of the radio now. Okay, and I'll adjust the antenna again. Yeah, I'm at the low end, it's not going to make much difference. So just again, to make it clear what I'm doing, this coil is connected to an outdoor antenna. It's an electronic antenna, it's not a wire antenna. It's a, uh, I'm not sure how to describe it just now. So a fairly strong signal is coming from outdoors to here. And then from here, it's going into the antenna. There. Where'd it go? What happened? I... What, what happened just now? Where'd it go? What happened? The she was working fine and now she's not. What happened? Can't be this. This can only boost it. Uh <laughs> where'd you go, radio? There's no local oscillator, I think. See how the radio doesn't change sound at all no matter where I tune it? That's a suggestion there's no local oscillator operating anymore. Where'd you go, man? That's not going to bring it back. If this doesn't bring it back... I'm really glad they had a tube failure right in the middle of me doing this, which is not very likely at all. <laughs> the situation's going downhill, Jim! Hey, I didn't have the volume turned up. Hey, what were we listening to there? What? Okay, turn the volume right down. Uh... brain infarction just now and <laughs> the result is uh, what happened to that radio it was working and then it wasn't and then it was hmm not sure what to think of that I might have to play this radio for an extended period see what it does hmm. working good now though that's for sure okay maybe a couple words about cleaning these things this is baked light Big light is a wonderful material. It's old radios are pretty much in this, you know, like new condition uh, if they've been taken care of. Um, whereas a plastic, uh, plastic is kind of chemically active. It's kind of wearing out and it's sensitive to ultraviolet light. And many plastics get really brittle later in their life. This stuff might get a little brittle too. But the thing about this is cleaning it. Um, if you get too aggressive at cleaning this material, there's a, uh, a thin um, 
layer, I guess we call it a layer, or surface. Let's call it a surface. The surface here is very flat. See how reflective it is and that beautiful shiny, and that's what gives it gives it a, its look. If you get too aggressive with this, you'll quickly remove that shiny layer, very thin shiny layer. You start revealing some of the actual material that this is made out of. This is a compound material that's made from, uh, and I'm going to forget all the proper words for it. Um, there's a fiber in here and uh, some, some kind of compound. Uh, the combination is what, what makes it like this. You get something uh, aggra uh, aggressive or abrasive and start going at it to try, try to clean it up. You'll start revealing some of the uh, material that's actually in here. It'll become kind of dotted, spotted, lose its, lose its shine. So basically what I'm saying is water. Clean it with water. And there's also a uh, test you can do. You know, you're wondering if this is really baked light. You put some water on it. You see the brownish yellow? You can't see it. Brownish yellow color coming off slightly, just, just with water. Um, some of that's dirt, of course, but some of it is the actual uh, baked light material, I think. So I'm not going to go too far here. The owner can, can do what they like with it. Uh, but me, I just take a damp cloth, damp piece of paper towel actually, and just go at it like that. Uh, because I know I can't damage it. Now there's lots of talk about using, uh, on, on the internet there's all kinds of instructions about doing this. Uh, Brasso seems to be talked about a lot. Next thing, but, but I wouldn't do it myself. Look at this thing, it's shiny beautiful just water nothing more these guys stay on because there's a little clip here's the clip the clips regularly fall out it's actually a spring they regularly fall out and get lost and then knob is loose so you don't want to lose these and they need to be in there and these are often uh, some water stuff for me cleaning this guy here uh, these are actually some of them are wedge shaped there's a, a smaller end and a wider end so they don't go right through when you put them in. Go in like that. And then fall out. Put it back in. Maybe this is maybe this is for the other knob. This one doesn't look right. Okay, the other knob has its metal piece in there already. So this has to come from here. And you look at it and you just rationalize where the flat is here and the shape of this and you just put it correct right from the start put it correct from the start wow. you gotta push hard on this to get it in there we go not all the way so it bangs into the cabinet then we have this little cover I gotta wash this I gotta wash these two guys looking very nice very nice looking radio. So you can see a couple of marks on the radio. One here, one here. I, I'm looking to see if the paint has been scraped off or if it's dirt. So this this one, the paint has been scraped off right here. This one is dirt. Let's see if we can make this one disappear. The other one, I don't know about. So I, I tried water and I've tried a little bit of uh, surfactant or soap. And I'm going to try some WD-40 because the uh, the soapy stuff I did, 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 the water didn't do anything. The soap hasn't done much. This is, this is a little damp. Does it really matter? I don't know. I'm not supposed to mix water and uh, WD-40. The WD stands for Water Displacement Formula Number 40. It's used on uh, rockets. Yeah, it spray this on the outside of a rocket, and when it flew through the atmosphere, it wouldn't collect moisture. Something like that. I, maybe I got the story wrong, but that's its origination. It's just nothing coming off here.
Well, I'm not going to work away at it any, any more than that. Because uh, the owner is just as capable of ruining this as me, so I'm going to leave it for them. Maybe it's a little lighter there. It's too bad. Maybe there's some way you can, I don't know, paint over that. Whoa, you'd have to match it perfectly or it even looks uglier. Sometimes a wear point on a radio, especially around the knobs, there's often finger scratching and wear points on that. That's just evidence of the life of the radio. It really shouldn't be viewed as a negative thing. Yeah, bangs and cracks and smashes. Paint speckles. You know what? This radio has no paint speckles, which is really unusual because most old radios have paint speckles on the top. This one doesn't. That's another sign of just, you know, this thing's been on the planet for quite a while, something like me, and uh, it should show some signs of it. If it doesn't show any sign of it, it would make you wonder what, what are you looking at. <laughs> okay, let's try it. Yeah, that's what I've been waiting for. So the switch is off. Yes, it's off. And we're going we're gonna to hit it with a full power, just like it's plugged into a regular outlet. I could actually plug it into a regular outlet if I want, but I won't. Here we go. A nervous moment. The light, the light is, what happened to the light? The light is on. Let's turn down the lights in here a bit. Hey, that's me. That's 610 St. Catharines. 640? 680? 740. It's an old time, uh, not old time, but music from some time ago when I was a kid on 740. They do old time radio programs at night too. That's the French station, French CBC. It's very hard to get anything more during the day up above here. Now I do have the antenna booster, but it's a foot from the radio right now. We might get the station right up here. So I'm going to put the uh, antenna booster right on top of the radio now. Go back down. Probably 11.50. This is Bloomberg uh, from Hamilton, Ontario, I believe. 11.50. This is probably 10.10. 10. Mm. Hmm. This is 9.70 from Buffalo. I think. That's really, look at the volume here. Excellent volume. That's 9.30, that's also, that's Buffalo. Something even weaker there, I don't know what that is. Okay. Yeah, you can still hear it. Can you? Who knows? Bottom line. Radio working good. Excellent. Very happy with that. Looks good. Works good. Very good. It's good, good. Okay.
so another radio something like this is coming in here tomorrow and uh, another 5 tube radio so fantastic thanks a lot for watching the series and uh, we'll see what happens on the next radio oh I just remembered and one last thing the intermittent failure of the radio there it just kind of went dead for a while and then suddenly it came back I found I had not soldered a particular capacitor uh, properly in fact it wasn't soldered so that was probably the cause it probably came off the terminal briefly and then made a contact again and uh, so I don't think that's a problem to, to, uh, that won't be a real current problem okay that's it bye bye